Welcome to Time to Teach with Tammy, the podcast that gives tips, advice, and suggestions to teachers by your real teacher. So sit back and enjoy, and oh yeah, don't forget to subscribe. Welcome back to episode 14, Building Classroom Community. And certainly as we are beginning the brand new school year, this is something that we are all working on. Uh, Well, we should be working on. I assume we're probably all working on classroom community. Uh, But this is huge and, you know, this is, I really can't even stress the importance of classroom community because it truly is everything. But, you know, as I've been preparing for the new school year and as of today's recording, today is August 15th, 2017. Today was our our first day back with students. So, you know, obviously this is something that we're very concerned with is the whole idea of establishing an identity with the class, getting to know the students, getting to know each other, and feeling comfortable with one another. But I have to say, as I was preparing for the show and thinking about the show and trying to look up ideas even for um, middle school and high school, uh, I always like to be prepared so that I'm covering the base on here for my topics for all grade levels. I want this to be relevant to everyone. I kept stumbling into just lots of different activities, which is not bad. I We're doing lots of community building activities, but I almost got a sense by going through these different activities that somewhere along the way, some of us may have really missed that message of what it is to build a, a community, a classroom community. It's not created by one activity. And I'm not condemning classroom community activities. No, I'm all for it and we're doing it. But I think it's important that we remember what we're actually doing with those activities. That They're not just single activities and we don't just do one activity and oh great now we're a classroom community we have to keep in mind the bigger picture of what we're actually doing when i think about a classroom community i do think about things like what what is our identity as a class what makes us special and unique some of what makes us special and unique are those unique things that we do as a class. So whatever routines that you have, whatever things that happen every single day is going to help create your classroom community. Like maybe you have a day, uh, especially this might be in the younger grades where you do uh, uh, share, like share and tell or show and tell, whatever, whatever it's called. I don't actually do that. Uh, I have um, something different. Kids will just randomly tell me, oh, I have this. I'd love to talk to the class about it. And that's that's pretty much how I run that. Um, not suggesting that's how you go about it, but some classes do show and tell or some kind of share. I have a colleague who does Star of the Week, and I think that's something that others do. And that this is good for establishing individual identities too, so that students get to know each other. But all of these special, unique things are special and unique to your classroom community. So even the fact that I just let kids randomly pick days, well, I mean, they don't get to randomly pick days when they want to share. It's a Friday. I don't go through each name and say, okay, this is your day. This is your Friday. Then you're next on next Friday. No, I just let them come up to me. And then if I happen to have several students who are wanting to share something, uh, then I have to make a list and put them on the Friday schedule. But mine is very kind of, you know, I just have to make time for it if I know I have a student who wants to share, but it's, I don't choose students each day. So that's unique to my classroom community, right? That's something unique to my class. Uh, someone who does a show and tell or a star of the week, 
that's unique to their classroom and their classroom community. But I think what we have to do is we have to remember with all of these exercises and games and activities that we're doing at the beginning of the school year to create this classroom identity, we have to remember what it all comes down to. It all comes down to building relationships. When we build relationships, this is going to be our biggest assurance that we will help establish the kind of classroom community that we really should be striving for because it's that special it's that special unique feeling that these students care for each other they care for me I care for them they know that they're cared for but that only happens when we focus on relationships and of course relationships are built around the things we do together so we do activities together we play games together we have conversations together everything you do can contribute and maintain that classroom community so we as we're going into the school year and as we're creating these activities we want to remember why what is the big idea behind it so I'll give you an example um, in the past two years our elementary section has been making classroom flags that's part of our identity right so we have a classroom flag we're proud of it that that shows who we are of course we have to have conversations about well not only what is a flag and what might go on a flag but uh, what do we feel is unique to us what do we feel would best represent who we are and really take that as an identity and refer back to it through the through the school last year we were the lupines yes we were <laughs> We're the lupines, um, this kind of tied into our garden theme. But it was something that we could refer back to. We could refer back to it and say, yes, we're, we're making the world a more beautiful place. And that's what we're striving for every single day. So it's something that we're, we don't just, you know, hit on once, but we can always refer back to because it's truly who we are. Now, this year, we're doing something a little bit different. We have decided that we are going to do a coat of arms and this is something that all, every class at the elementary section is going to do now but again this one activity doing a coat of arms is this going to create our classroom community well of course not it's one activity so this is where we have to be very careful about tying those community building activities into the bigger picture. The bigger picture is, of course, getting to know each other, getting to really find out who we are, and building those relationships. So this is why I'm saying I'm not against those activities. Please, I really am promoting it, so I hope it doesn't come off as I'm not. But I just get the sense that when I look online and I'm seeing all these different activities, I don't see a whole lot of websites that are actually talking about what it is what is the heart of what we're trying to do and it, it's it's the heart that's what it is it's it's the emotional piece that we want to tap into so that means that many different activities would actually be very good activities as long as we tie it in to tapping into our class and our students and building on the relationship we need to do that now because when we don't, when there's not a relationship there, we miss a big opportunity. And I really feel like, for me, I always feel like I go into every school year for the relationships. You know, I am excited about getting to know these kids. I'm excited about hopefully being, a, you know, a, a positive piece in their life. And I know I can only do that if I have a good relationship. So these are super important things. So I just want to talk to you. I did find I did find a good article that I really liked because it was one of the few that I felt, okay, this one 
taps into more of what I think we need to keep in mind. And it's from Scholastic. And as always, I will include it in the show notes. But this is one of the very few pieces that I saw that really talked about the bigger things that we're doing with our classroom community. So I want to go, I want to kind of summarize a few things. Um, The first thing that the article talks about, and by the way, the article is called uh, Building Community in the Classroom, and the author is Ellen Booth Church. So it starts with the the, um, subheading, it's the beginning of the new school year. Now is the time to create a secure, nurturing, supportive environment. I was really drawn in by that subheading because I feel like that's what we're doing with the classroom community. It's really about that, uh, I like the word she uses, the nurturing, supportive environment and the secure environment. It is a place where students know they can go in and it's a safe place, right? They have, they have at least one adult advocate at least one. Maybe you have more teachers in your classroom, so they might have a couple. I have a support teacher who does push in a couple times a week and then pull pull out as well. Uh, I also have a teacher assistant. So really, those students are so fortunate. They have three advocates right there in that classroom. Three adults who are advocating for them who are trying to make them feel like this is your safe place. You are safe here, regardless of what else is going on. And we're supporting their efforts. It's a supportive place. So this is what every student needs. And I feel like as we're establishing our classroom community, that's really what we want to establish. Because until we establish that, it's going to get hard to get student buy-in and I think that's especially true for the older grades but it is also true for the younger grades you know that that relationship is so extremely important so uh, one of the first things that this article touches on is building community through identity I love this I love this so much because I feel like this is a piece that students really need. First of all, they need to understand who they are as individuals. And I've talked about this in past episodes if if you've listened to uh, whichever one I mentioned this in, but um, we start with the myself unit. So I love this unit. I love it because it meets our students right where they are. You know, they're like five going on six. Some of them are already six. But they're very egocentric. That comes with the age. So we do, we start with that. We start with who, who am I? Really identifying themselves as individuals, understanding that, oh, I have special interests. I have, I have special talents. I have things that make me special and unique. And then I have a family and that makes me special. My family is going to have similarities to other families, but we're also going to be unique. So we kind of branch it out, but we start with that identity, really letting them bring that sense of pride and what, what, how they connect with their own identity and their identity within the family, bringing that into the classroom and getting to share that. So this is something that's very important. So I loved that this was touched on in the article because I think yes this is so this is how we start building those relationships that we're taking time think about your own personal relationships it's usually not one-sided but we really want to get to know each other and as we get to know each other we get to know about the things that interest us and the things that we like to do that's how we start to slowly build those relationships The next item in this article is building community through familiarity. Now, this is brilliant. This is brilliant because I have not seen this touched on in almost any place online. I just, I can't find anything that really touches on these 
these key pieces that make community building possible. But um, it is it is the things that are familiar to them. It's things that they can relate to, things that they might have experienced in some way. So for like, you know, I don't know, young students, I can just kind of going back on my own students, there are kinds of books that they really like, like the Mo Willems, Piggy and Elephant, Pigeon. Um, they get exposure to that from the early grades. So having some of those kinds of books that they're used to is something that they can connect to. So that that gives them that gives them something familiar. It helps them puzzles or games that they might have played before or experienced. Now this is an idea that can be used not just in the lower grades, but I think even middle school and high school, if teachers find out the kinds of maybe activities or games, if there are any games, I know um, having time for things like that can be very difficult, but anything that they might have used or done that would be familiar, they can include in those beginning weeks to establish community. So things that are familiar to them, that they can connect to, and it does help to establish that sense of security definitely in the younger grades and like I said I think that's something that can be included in the older grades I know that a lot of times there is this feeling of we need to get to the academics quickly and perhaps there is well there's never there's never as much time to really honestly do anything we'd like to do right but um, you know there's this push to get to the academics as quickly as possible but I think we really need to establish those important relationships and this is one thing that we can do is just giving them a piece of something that they can connect to something that's familiar to them um, across the grade levels and I think something that happens is when students have something that is familiar to them and they, you know, they've experienced before, obviously it gives them a sense of comfort. I think that's obvious. But the other thing that, maybe it's obvious too, but the other thing that happens in that situation is that a lot of times they want to share those things. They want to share share what they're feeling or their experience with it with you. It's something that they know and um, they like to share that with you. I, even this morning I had one of my new, well they're all new because today's first day of school so, uh, but one of the one of the students came in and she was noticing one of the books in, in my classroom library and she became so excited and she told me how she used to read that book last year so it, it it also you know not only comforts them and this is something that I know um, for them but it gives them a little piece of conversation it gives them something to talk about because it's something that they can relate to and I just feel like it's such a powerful thing that we should be utilizing absolutely so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of continue on through the article. So um, identity we've talked about, we have talked about kind of com uh, building community through things that are familiar. The next thing that the article discusses is using what the, their wording, warmth and beauty. So according to them, studies have shown, I'm quoting right now, studies have shown that warm colors and soft spaces are welcoming. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's very true. I think we have to be very conscious of that physical environment because of course, when we're talking about classroom community, we, we're putting an emphasis on that uh, emotional and the, the relationship and the connection so which is the most important but then there is that aesthetic piece that draws them in and it really you know it is for them and for ourselves it is a second home so we like to be in an environment that is welcoming and I think that is very true for our students so this one this article in this section discussed like um, 
putting lots of pillows and toys if they're young kids, um, even including flowers, things that are going to give it the appearance of, again, something that's familiar to them, but almost very home-like. It becomes something that they really connect with and it, they feel like they're at home because it's a similar environment. And, um, you know, I would really like to do more of this. I thought about it over the summer that I wanted to get some lamps and I just never did because I just never did. <laughs> I would still like to and um, uh, the opportunity has not been missed, but it has been missed to have that established on the first day to have lamps in my room. But but so I do I would still like to do that. But but I do want to have. Um, something nice in the classroom as a lamp and I think that might kind of add to that feeling of home but yeah you know it just gives them that sense of you know I know this kind of environment and it feels good and it looks good and I think that's very true for the way that we want our own spaces to be so as we're setting up or as we're continuing to continuing to set up like in my case not that I'm continuing to set up my room is set up but I'd love to have some lamps in there so I definitely want to maybe slowly bring in things that can give like a, a very homey feeling I do have three bean bags um I think all all elementary classrooms do because that was provided uh last year last year I want to say it was the first year but we do have that and the kids love it and it gives them a really nice relaxing place so yeah definitely helping to create and build that community through the warmth and the beauty of the actual physical environment okay the next item on this list in this article is using trust again now we're really getting to the nitty-gritty of what we are really doing when we talk about classroom community and that's it i i really feel like the the trust that we establish or hopefully not but don't establish these are things that really can make or break what we're doing in the classroom so it's um you know it's just it's such a critical critical piece and I think in some ways it's difficult. I mean, not that we ever as teachers go around deliberately doing things that would make our students not trust us. But I think when I think about the trust, a lot of times it's established by being the adult in their life, specifically the teacher who listens when some when that student is really struggling through something. And we get very busy and things happen um, constantly and sometimes it's really difficult to stop I mean it is I, I don't know I don't have the per I don't have the answer for this because this is the struggle and I feel like this is something that I'm always which is nice that I have a TA uh, four days out of the week because my students, you know, there's a lot of, there's high emotions. They're coming from early childhood, so it's their first year in elementary that, you know, it's it causes a lot of anxiety in the beginning of the school year. And then even throughout the year, even once they have adapted and adjusted to life in elementary, they're still, they're, they're young, so things are difficult emotionally for them. They're still really learning. So a lot of things end up coming up. A lot of things will happen at recess and as I'm welcoming them back into the classroom and directing them to go sit in their carpet square, I get a lot of, you know, this happened or that happened. It, it can feel very overwhelming. Sometimes I really have to sift through, is this something that really needs to be listen to boy that sounds so bad but is this something that we we need to discuss right now in this moment or is this something that can wait so I'm kind of quietly mentally sifting through all all because many times there's several students coming in with you know this happened and that happened and I have to really make those decisions right right then and there about what needs to be 
dealt with right now because if, if there are most or if there are students coming into the classrooms with high emotions the the academics have no chance uh, so that's why it's really nice I do have a TA so if I either if it's if it's to the point where I feel like I need to step out and, and figure this out and I will do that, my TA can take over. Um, or sometimes it's, you know what, maybe this conflict broke out with these students and they just need to have some kind of mediator to help them, um, then she can go and, and do that. But it's really, you know, I think when we stop and we do that, we're, t we're showing our students that, that we really care about them and in turn, they will trust us. You know, they get the idea that, okay, you're someone who cares, I can trust you. Now, I, I wanna share a sad story that I am not happy that um, I did my first year of teaching. So uh, you can learn, learn the lesson for me. This was, I was teaching high school and I believe this is ninth grade English because I am, uh, I have two teaching credentials, but my secondary credential in California, uh, secondary would be seven through 12th and you get a single subject credential and so I'm credentialed to teach English. And so this is ninth grade English. I had, I was also teaching um, ESL, you know, it was a, uh, challenging class which I was very interested in in fact when I went through my masters I was researching on how to build a positive classroom climate and with your most challenging your most if you can think of your most challenging situation that's what I was interested in so uh, I I had that challenge that year so uh, it, it was definitely a challenging year, but we're, I just remember this day, this morning, and I don't know what it is that we were doing. And let me preface this by saying, I love humor. <laughs> I love to laugh. I love people who make me laugh. I find humor in almost everything. So that's just who I am. And perhaps that came out in not the best way in this class. So ninth grade, we were in class and we were doing something and then a student, he raised his hand and said, oh, you know, in my history class, my teacher does whatever, whatever it is. And I made the grand mistake of saying, oh, uh, what class was that? You know, this was actually more than just humor. It was sarcasm. I don't suggest doing this when your student's reputation, which was not my intention. I had, I just did not see this coming, what I'm about to tell you. Um, but it was a train wreck. Anyway, so I said, what class was this? And he said, history. He didn't realize I was being sarcastic. And the whole class laughed. And I felt awful when this happened and he hated me from that day on he hated me and I felt awful I felt horrible but there was no repairing this relationship actually it was so bad that he just would not even participate in class he was disruptive and he ended up having to sit in the hall I think I got help with that from someone because I didn't know what to do and that was advice from someone now I wonder was that really good advice I don't know um, so you know I lost his trust at that point I lost everything with that student because I was just being me which is oftentimes funny and somewhat sarcastic never ever with bad intentions but granted sometimes things come out wrong or sometimes they're take it wrong or in this case where I didn't see the whole class laughing and him taking it as them laughing at him uh, it just backfired it backfired on me so 
don't do that. Uh, sarcasm, I, I can kind of do it at the younger age because they don't always get it, but I, I do suggest to be very careful with that. Um, my lesson was learned. I have not forgotten that. I think I will never forget that, and I feel horrible to this day. I feel horrible because those were not my intentions, but it happened nonetheless, and um, you know, I lost his trust. So that was, I, like I said, I lost his trust. And on that day, I lost everything with him. And I don't think he ended up passing the class. I don't remember for sure. But I'm guessing if he spent every day in the hall, yeah, he probably did not pass. So, you know, we have to do things. We have to take the time to listen. And we have to take the time to show students that we care about them. So when something happens, listening to them, taking that time, taking time to work through them. Again, I understand this is not a perfect, there's no perfect way to do it. And of course it's difficult because we as teachers are really juggling all these things that we do. And we know as teachers, teaching is one thing that we do. It's not everything that we do, but it is, it's one thing that we do. So establishing trust and maintaining that trust is absolutely necessary to that classroom community that we want to build if we're interested in academics. And of course we are, and that's why we're in the classroom. That's absolutely what we are interested in. So, um, you know, we've just got to find those ways to show our students that we care. And one thing that I do, and I, it, this tends to be, um, you know, like an elementary thing, maybe, although I'd, I'd love to see this happen at the secondary level, and I think it could, and I think it might in different ways, but classroom meetings, I think I've mentioned this before, but at classroom meetings is when I really have taken the time on my weekly planner, which is digital, <laughs> but it's in there, and you know you have to remove something we don't we only have the time that we have so i have to remove what we typically do on friday morning and that's when we have our classroom meeting and that's the those are the days that we get to talk about emotions those are the days that we get to talk about things that i really wish we had ample time to sit and discuss every day in in depth and in length but friday i i have always no i have not always i've only done classroom meetings the last couple of years now i think maybe this is my third maybe it's my fourth i can't remember but it's been a couple of years because i was never trained in it and i i just kind of stumbled across it our school um likes us to do it and so that's when i became interested and starting to learn more and learning how to establish and implement this so yeah so classroom meetings and if there's a way that you can do that at the secondary level I really encourage that having some 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 type of something carved out in your week where you can really get to the emotions and the social piece the emotional piece because that's what they need and when we take time to do that then they know okay my teacher really cares and that really helps to make everything easier okay next on the list in this article and, and I definitely know that this is true for younger students for sure I would say there's probably room for this in um, older students as well but the idea of predictability and you know that comes through routines this definitely is critical at young age in fact on my first day with the meetings I talked to the parents about helping their children transition into pre first the grade that I teach the first year in elementary coming from our early childhood section but um, just establishing routines at home because that's also what we're doing in the classroom it just gives them a sense of confidence but also a sense of security because they always know what's going to happen you know there's uh, there's uh the events are sequential they know maybe the, uh, my kids won't know the time although i've had a few kids who who caught on to times by you know we don't actually teach time in pre-first but i 
have definitely had at least one student a few years ago who could look at the clock and know that, oh yeah, it's supposed to be recess time. So, but typically at my student stage, they're not telling time, but they can know the sequence that, oh, okay, this is our read aloud time, right? After read aloud is recess. And after recess, we always have word work. And then after word work, we always have writing workshop. The same things happen at the same time. And that gives that just gives them so much confidence and, and just kind of reassures them of what's going to happen next. And like I said, I... I guess I can't really confirm this at the older grade just because I would n need to look at the research that might confirm this. Maybe some of you can confirm and let me know. But just being that I am a mother of a 15 year old, I just even know with her, uh, within her own life here at home, you know, there are sequential events and I feel like that helps my daughter. You know, she knows that when she comes home, she has a little bit of rest time. Then she has her homework time. We have dinner. And so we have these events that happen. Now, granted, once in a while, things might get a little off track. Um, like right now, our dog got hurt and she spent a week at the vet's and she has to go for a checkup every three days. So that kind of throws off our schedule and routines at home because we obviously have to drive to the vet and do her checkup. But, so things are going to throw you off, but I think the more that things are sequential and happen pretty regularly, more or less, that's going to help them. I know it helps my daughter because then she knows that, okay, I need to do this now. And um, yeah, I think it's very helpful. Again, I, I would actually be very interested in any secondary teacher, see, you know, just hearing if that's something that you have seen to be true, or maybe you know to be true because you've read the research. I am really interested in that, but um, yeah, those routines, those procedures, sequential, predictable events, especially at the, the younger grades. Okay, next on building a classroom community is actually through getting the family involved. Now, I know that this can be a challenge. This can be a challenge for various reasons. It could be a challenge because maybe it happens to be a student whose parents just in general are not involved. Um, it might be a situation in which the parent is involved as much as possible, but uh, that parent's time is limited due to work. That happens to me. Um, obviously, I'm a mother, I am a teacher, and those things are very difficult. So, you know, I'm very fortunate that my husband gets to attend. He kind of is the one who attends most of my daughter's school functions um, and I attend the ones that I can but um, you know that's very critical is that when you can involve the family then you're really bringing everyone together everyone the student the teacher and the family so this is just hugely important and seeing the connection that you know it's not just here or it's not just there but we're we're really it's almost like a chain that we're all co we're connected and we're doing this as a team um now if it's an event that you know some parents can attend some can't you know it's it's really difficult at the young age when it's an event that a parent can't attend and that can be very heartbreaking for the child so I know for myself if it if that's the case I always just recommend and well suggest that okay if if mom or dad can't attend can you you know please have um, a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle or something like that just so the child has some someone there I'm very fortunate in the school where I'm at because it's very the family, um, the families are very hands-on. So getting, getting family involvement is, you know, it happens. It's pretty easy, so and that that's great. But there are all are also other ways. 
aside from just events and getting families to attend, it's really creating that connection of keeping them maybe updated on what's happening to the classroom and, you know, good communication. So that might be in form of, um, I email my parents every single day and I just, you know, send a little note about, oh, this is, you know, this is what we did today. This is what we worked on. And of course, a class website, I keep a class website and that just gives them the rundown pretty much of the academics that are happening. But then on Fridays, I post pic all the pictures that I've taken of the week of their students working and doing various things. And I post that and they like to see those. They love those. Um, that gives them, you know, that really keeps them tuned into this is what's happening and this is how it's happening. And they get to see their, their children in action and it's so great. And then also I think it's important that we remember to, you know, when we see a, a parent as in person or maybe if we don't see a person by sending an email and just a quick update like, oh, you know, your child had such a great day or this happened or just sharing a story that um, they might think is funny or appreciate and it just you know it makes that connection also shows the parents that you care and you know when the parents care that you get more buy-in and it's just better for the students it's better for you it's better for their family and um, it really really speaks to the whole idea of it takes a village to raise a child so you're connecting all those pieces and when we connect those pieces it's going to equal to a higher chance of student success it just increases those chances so that's pretty much what was in this article i summarized it read just you know quoted just a very brief part of it but I do I really loved this article because I felt like it touched on what I think that we might sometimes lose sight of what we're really doing when we're doing all these building community activities it, you know it's just very important that we remember why we're doing those activities there's so many great community building activities as long as we keep in mind that all of that is really because we're trying to establish these relationships and again like I said earlier relationships are established by you know the conversations that we have the activities that we do the events maybe that we attend together so so that's really at the heart of what it is so you know I just want us all to keep that in mind I think it's so hugely important remembering that we want to establish it establish a a community, a very strong classroom community, and then continuing to do things actually throughout the school year that are going to help to promote a healthy community and maintain a healthy community. So why do we go ahead and close this by just recapping on what those key points were in the article. And again, this article, the article link will be included in today's show notes. So we said, how do we build a strong classroom community? We can do that through identity, familiarity, warmth and beauty, trust, predictability, and through family involvement. I wish you all a wonderful beginning of the school year. There are more episodes to come in the back to school series, but um, yeah, I think this one is very critical when we're talking about the success of our school year. So I wish you luck in this and I hope that you got something that you can use from today's episode. I'll see you next time. Wait a minute. Wait one minute. Before you go, don't forget you can catch our show notes online at www.timetoteach.libsyn. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. We're also on Facebook at Time to Teach. Don't forget to check out our Facebook group, Teachers for Effective Curriculum. And if you're an educator with your own podcast show, I invite you to join our brand new Facebook group, Teachers Who Podcast. 
Let's grow a community where we can network, problem solve, and discuss anything and everything podcast related. I'll see you there.